Hey, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Beth in my closet in North Carolina. And this is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. Good going on? morning. I know. I'm on like my junky computer today, so we'll see. Can you, can you hear me out there? Anybody hear me? Hello. Is this thing on? <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me now? <laughs> Anybody remember those commercials? <laughs> yes. Yeah. How about now? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, Christy? <sighs> Not a whole lot. Um, uh, coming off of last week's episode, I did want to mention, because we said something about superlatives in this that last episode yeah. and another one previous to that. And I looked in uh, my son's yearbook and there were none, but then I had a friend from Florida write me saying, hey, by the way, they still do superlatives. So, you know, and you just told me that your fifth grade son's class does it. Yeah. So, you know, I feel like it's just dependent on the school. I got gotcha. you. Basically. Still no answer. I know. <laughs> I mean, there's an answer, but it's. <laughs> I would guess that my high school probably still does them. My high school, I don't even remember them doing it. Oh. I need to go back and look at my yearbook. Clearly, and back then. Christy was not in the running for any surprise. Yeah. Best hair. Yeah. <laughs> Most schools. Oh, hell no. <laughs> I was like, I was that middle of the road person. Like, I wasn't part of the cool group, but I wasn't part of the, like, you know, loser group. <laughs> I think that was most of us, honestly. Yeah. I mean, I, maybe other people think differently. Don't tell me if you did. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> let, let her believe what she wants to about her high school life. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, yeah. we're recording a little bit early because I am going to Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge this weekend with my girlfriends and my sisters because yes. this is what I do in October, guys. I celebrate mm -hmm. all the month long. <laughs> <laughs> and then a little bit into the next. <laughs> it's true. Yes. I'm taking over part of November this year too, because I'm going to be 40. So I'm, I'm, yeah, we're starting it off. Well, that, that sounds be, cool. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and um, also, I mean, you're going to have a ton of fun, but my husband and a couple of coworkers and slash friends are running the Boston Marathon the day this episode comes out. So go guys. Run, run, run. Wait, Good do luck. they have so a awesome. team name? <laughs> <laughs> you better figure it out so you can make some posters or something. Well, I'm only making signs for my husband. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Well, go Emery. Yeah, I'm making, yes, go Emery. Run. So proud. So for exciting. Sure. Um, He's done a marathon before though. This is not a done the New York. One, right? He did New York. Right. It's so And cool. one in Raleigh. A marathon? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't remember what happened. I don't know if something got canceled or whatever, but he wanted to run another one. Or he was going to do the New York again. I don't remember the reasoning. But then all of a sudden he was like, oh, there's one in Raleigh. I was training. It's next weekend. I'm just going to do that one. Well, you That's know what? I do remember him doing that, actually. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I remember the little the tracker app where you – Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. so, so cool. I can't, mm -hmm. I, I think people that do that, like train their bodies to do that. We've talked about this before. They're amazing. That's so cool. It's amazing. Well, it's amazing, but yet watching it. Oh my gosh. He's like, his knee's a mess. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. So he's never running one again. He's like stated that. He's oh, like, this is it. wow. Mm -hmm. So then that's yeah. a big deal. Yeah. This is yeah, yeah. Marathon. Allegedly. Yep. yep. Well, no, I really think it is because his he's messed up <laughs> his body. My husband's best friend that he grew up with is an ultra marathoner. So he runs the hundred mile ones. That is insane. bananas. It takes him like over 24 hours and like bananas. Could you imagine running 24 hours straight? Like, no, no, absolutely not. I can't imagine running one hour straight. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I can't anymore. We used to do those Ragnars. Well, used to. I did one where it's um, – or did I do two? I don't remember. One. Where it's 200 miles, but it's a team. But you're running for like two oh, days. Oh, yeah. Straight, like a relay team, right? Not, yeah, but not straight because you're relaying. But you're like constantly – you know, you take turns sleeping because one van's going then the next van goes. <laughs> anyway, it's funny. It's insane but fun. Yeah. I'm a 5 k -er. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with my ten-year-old, that's a, that's it. That's mm -hmm. all I got in me as far as running yeah. goes. 
It's all that's necessary. I agree. Yep. You can mm-hmm. eat the tacos. Mm-hmm. You run the 5K, you eat the tacos. You don't feel bad. What else do you need? <laughs> very, very true. <laughs> Had the beer after. <laughs> a banana. They always give you a banana. Oh, yeah. Banana. <laughs> Where's my taco? I go straight for the beer garden. You go for the they banana. Got it. I, I got to tell you, if they put a taco truck at the end of the 5K, I would get better time. <laughs> I would run Why after. maybe one, number one? Yeah. I want the good the, when it's hot. <laughs> true very true mm-hmm. <laughs> strategy out there guys yeah all right well i have a crime story for you if you're done talking about tacos if i'm done talking about tacos yeah i'm done, I'm done. <laughs> okay I'm go emery have a great marathon and here is a crime for you All right, this is a suggestion by my sister, Laura, who has given us some pretty good suggestions in the past, and it is fantastic. I had this on my list anyway, and so when she suggested it, it kind of bumped it up for me, so great minds. Cool. This is the story of Lori Hayes. Lori Hayes. Wow, Mm -hmm. that sounds familiar, but I doubt doubt it. It's probably just a name that sounds familiar. (laughs) Never know. So on August 1st of 1999, in a shopping center parking lot in Springfield, Illinois, shoppers and patrons heard a baby crying from a parked car. The car was a white Jeep, and when they approached the car, they could see that there was a baby in the back seat, in a car seat, alone, covered up by a blanket. Now this is August, so it's dog days of summer and it was over 90 degrees on this day. So this poor baby was way too hot sitting in this car and there was no sign of an adult or anyone to help the baby. Oh my gosh. The two front windows were rolled down and the car was unlocked. So the people who found the baby got the baby out of the car to cool it off and called police. Again, no sign in all this time of who the owner of the car is. So CPS came and took the baby. She was checked out and she was determined to be dehydrated and scared, but otherwise okay. But we have no idea why she was abandoned in this hot car. They immediately run the plates of the car and it's registered to 26-year-old Brad Hayes and his 25-year-old wife, Lori Hayes. So they immediately dispatched someone to their house, which was about 15 minutes away, to do a welfare check. But nobody was home, so they just decided to stay there and wait until somebody showed up. In the meantime, police start to examine the car and find some things that make them suspect there may have been foul play involved. Mm. First off, the contents of Lori's purse were dumped out into the floor of the passenger seat. Uh-huh. So they that's when they suspect, okay, Lori was driving the car because here's her purse. Mm. Nothing seems to be taken out of her purse. Her wallet is there. It has cash in it. It has credit cards. So it doesn't seem like robbery was a motive for whatever happened here. They then find blood on the back bumper of the car and a spent shell casing from a twenty eight caliber pistol in the back of the car. Oh. So this is not a good sign, especially because both Lori and Brad could not be located and their baby was left alone in the car. Right. So there were 12 security cameras in the parking lot where the Jeep was found. 11 of the 12 of them worked. One was broken. (laughs) And true to Murphy's Law, (laughs) it happened to be the only one that was pointed at the Jeep. So the police were unable to get any footage of the happenings of the car. Mm. They asked around to all of the stores and businesses in the shopping center. Nobody reported anything unusual happening that day. Nobody could really remember seeing Lori or the baby. You know, it was just like, yeah, it's busy today. Like, we don't really know. We don't, we we can't say, you know, anything about this. Mm. Okay. So who are Lori and Brad? Lori was born Lori M. Kotzbauer. On May 10th of 1974 in Kentucky, I don't have a lot of information about them or their childhood or 
growing up life, but she is described as cheerful and positive and beautiful. She has a sister. She was very close with her parents and family. And she married a man named Brad Hayes. And the two of them moved to Springfield, Illinois in 1998. And they had a baby girl that they named Alexis. That was the baby that was found in the back of the Jeep. At the time that uh, Lori's car was found in 1999, Alexis was 10 months old. Hmm. So finally, around 4 p.m. that day, Brad comes home. He pulls in the driveway. He opens the garage. He gets out. It's totally normal. Police approach him and they ask him if he knows where Lori is. And he's really confused and says that he doesn't know where she is. She should be home or around somewhere. He has been on a business trip to Denver and had flown back that day and landed at about 1 p.m. Oh. So he was in a softball league and they had a game that day. So instead of coming home after his business trip, he went straight to the softball field and played in the game. Mm. The police tell him about finding Lori's car and he acted really confused and shocked and was kind of hysterical because he wanted to know where his baby was. Right. And so it seemed very appropriate, his reaction. Yes. Yeah. But, you yeah, know. Lori's family back in Kentucky was called and they drove the six hours straight to Springfield to help lo- uh, look for Lori. Lori's mom had actually just left Lori's house that day and went back to Kentucky. She had come to Illinois to stay with Lori to help her with the baby while Brad was out of town on his business trip. Mm -hmm. But because Brad was flying back in that day, that morning she got up and she went back home to Kentucky. When she left, Lori had told her that she was going to go shoe shopping that afternoon. So they suspect that's what she was doing at the shopping center. So search parties began to go out. Hundreds of people were combing over the surrounding areas around the shopping center where the car was found. Night comes. The next day comes. There's still no sign of Lori. They haven't heard from her. Nothing. But the police are still searching. Mm -hmm. Then the family gets the call that we all knew was coming, but that everyone was dreading. A deputy was searching out in a rural, rural I can never say that word. <laughs> There's so many words. <laughs> it it makes say. me sound like like a really dumb person. When, rural part of town. Mm-hmm. And he sees fresh tire tracks that are going into a cornfield. This is strange to him. So he gets out and looks around and he notices drag marks going into the field. So he follows them. And about 70 feet in, he finds the body of a young woman. He immediately recognizes her from the missing person flyers and calls in that he believes he had found Lori Hayes deceased. Mm, She was 25 years old. My goodness. So now we are going to get into the investigation right after this break. This episode is brought to you by Best Fiends. Fall is upon us. The weather is cooling off and the leaves are starting to change and all the holidays are headed our way. My recommendation to you is to enjoy those pleasant fall evenings, engaging your brain with my favorite mobile puzzle game, Best Fiends. I love laying in my hammock with a cup of tea and escaping into a fun world of colors and characters. My kids even try to get in on the game. I'm on level 220, and honestly, I don't know how I got there so quickly. It's just that easy to get lost in the fun. So engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters from your hammock, porch, or couch this fall. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated puzzle game is a must-play. So download Best Fiends free in the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, best fiends. Lori was fully clothed, but her clothes were torn and disheveled. Hmm. She was still wearing her wedding, wedding rings. So they're pretty convinced that robbery was not a motive. Again, it was determined that Lori had been sexually assaulted and semen was present in several places on her body. 
Her cause of death was a gunshot wound to the back of the head with a 38 caliber pistol. They believed that she had been killed prior to being drug into the cornfield. Oh, gosh. Detectives hold a press conference and ask the police for help. But in the meantime, they, of course, are looking at Brad. Because we all know spouses and significant others are prime suspects. Also, Lori's friends, when they were questioned, reported that since the baby had been born, Lori and Brad's marriage had changed and kind of gone downhill somewhat. Mm. And from their perspective, was straightened. Well, but wasn't he on a flight? He was, yes. Okay, Okay. that's my next sentence. They did confirm that Brad had been in Denver and that he had flown back that day, which was August 1st, and landed at 1 o'clock. They also then confirmed that he was at the softball field and played his game. And then he said he went straight home. So he has an alibi. Okay. All right. However, a tip had been called in by a person working across the street from the shopping center. And he reported seeing a white male driving a white Jeep similar to Lori's out of the parking lot and that the man who was driving it had been wearing a baseball hat. So remember, Mm. Brad was playing softball, so he had been wearing a baseball hat. So the police are still side-eyeing him, even though he has this alibi. They're still keeping him in the pocket. Was he at the game the entire time, or is there any point at which he... They reported he was. So it would have been a real small window. It's not really possible that he could have done it, but, you know, Mm -hmm. we also can't 100% rule him out based on this alibi, so we're just... But because it does seem pretty likely that it was not Brad, they are continuing to look into other people. Mm -hmm. But then the rape kit DNA test results come in, and it is determined that Brad is not a match. Oh, Oh, So Brad is cleared and is able to get Alexis back from CPS because the baby was having to stay with CPS all this time because they didn't know whether dad had been involved. Yeah. Gosh. Oh, my gosh. Poor thing. In an interesting turn of events, the DNA results are a match to the semen on a cold case from one year prior involving a local female real estate agent. Hmm. Okay, so they run it through CODIS. It doesn't match anyone in the system, but it does match a rape case from a year ago that was unsolved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so it's this real estate agent. I have her name from court records, but she doesn't want it to be publicized otherwise. So I'm not going to use it here just out of respect for her. The realtor, um, she had been showing a house to a man. And once they were inside the house, the man had locked the door, frisked her, took Mace out of her pocket, held her at gunpoint and asked her to strip and pose while he took pictures of her. What? She was then sexually assaulted multiple times, and the man was then taking her out of the house, but she outsmarted him and was able to push him out the door and then lock herself in the house. Oh, my. And get help. Okay. So police were called, but by the time they arrived, the man had fled, and her rapist was never identified or found. So the case went completely unsolved. And she, I mean, she clearly had a description of him because she She was showing him a house. She did have a description of him. That is correct. She also had a voicemail message from him because he had called her and left her a voicemail message saying, I'd like to look at this property and this property. And, you know, so if you could set up showings for these things, whatever. So she's got him a voicemail message from him and she also has a description of him. Right. Now, so, I just, can I just put, say something real quick right here? Um, I'm going to say that I'm surprised, and maybe it does, and I just haven't looked at the statistics, that this doesn't happen more often because, I mean, you're you're alone in a house with people, like yeah. random people that just call you and say, I want to go see this house. Like, yeah. this, I'm surprised that I don't hear it more often. I'd have to look that up. And it's a dangerous what, job being yeah. a real estate mm-hmm. agent, huh? Yeah, yeah. you're right. Okay, so police know that the same man who raped this realtor also raped and likely killed Lori Hayes. So if they can solve the rape case, they can solve Lori's murder. Mm -hmm. And they have an eyewitness who is alive. 
So right. she's the warrior, right? Okay. Yeah. So the real estate agent made a sketch of the man who assaulted her. They know he was a middle-aged white man. He spoke calmly to her and had locked the doors, frisked her, and carried a thirty-eight caliber pistol. This made them suspect that he may be involved in law enforcement, mm-hmm. which is exactly where my head went to when yep. she said he frisked her. Mm-hmm. The sketch and description were released to the public. And another police officer in the area said that she thought the sketch resembled this man that she had recently arrested for sexual assault. His name was Marcus White. Okay. So investigators show Marcus White's picture in a photo lineup to the realtor, and she positively identifies him as her assailant. Whoa. (laughs) Marcus was brought in for questioning denied the rape, denied anything to do with Lori Hayes. His DNA was obtained, but it was not a match. Does he have a twin? So this was, no. (laughs) (laughs) Or I don't think he had a brother either. I don't know. (laughs) But this had been a situation of mistaken identity. Wow. Because she ID'd him in that photo lineup and it he, he it wasn't a match. Well, I mean, honestly, think for on his part, thank goodness for DNA, because if he had just been identified by the victim, there's a chance he would have just been arrested and like they would have had to try and pull, you know, proof together. But right. I mean, it would have it would have gone longer on longer for him yes. if they didn't have that DNA to just rule him out. Right. Exactly. But anyway, so the police are now at a dead end. So they re-released the sketch of the man. And then they get a call from a woman who runs a security company. This woman had recognized the man in the sketch as someone who she thought might work for her. And his name was Dale Lash. Now, let me tell you what this woman did. She is a sleuth. (laughs) Love me some sleuths. The woman said that she saw the sketch and went and, and thought, I think you know this guy. And she went and pulled personnel files of this Dale Lash guy. And she was like, man, that, it really looks like him. I think mm. that this is him. I think that's who it is. So she takes it upon herself to track down the rape victim. Uh-huh. What? <laughs> Contacted her and showed her the photo of Dale. And said, is this the guy? And the real estate agent was like, yes, that is 100% him. Does so, he look like the other guy? He does, actually. Okay. So once she got confirmation that the real estate agent was like, yeah, this this is him, that's when she calls the police. Oh, my. Okay. <laughs> Sounds cool, right? But the police were mad. Well, I was They were say. mad. Because, and we love a sleuth. We do. Yeah. But there's a procedural and legal way to mm-hmm. go about things, and especially showing eyewitness photos to people right. they have to be in a lineup there has mm-hmm. to be between like six and ten photos and the witness has to pick the person out from several photos they can't just show them one picture and be like was this him mm-hmm. all right cool right that's i mean those things can't be entered into evidence and now she's seen the picture so now they can't do that <laughs> right exactly right. now her her account is tainted theoretically mm-hmm. So this sleuth has potentially harmed their investigation. So don't do that, people. (laughs) Don't do that. Be a sleuth, but be a quiet sleuth and contact the police first. (laughs) Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Stay stay on the the, uh, interweb. Mm -hmm. However, they do notice that this Dale Lash guy does look a whole lot like Marcus White who is the one that the rape victim had previously identified from the photo lineup. So they're like, well, maybe it's worth a try for us to give it a shot and look into this Dale Lash guy. So they do. Dale Lash was a 38-year-old man. He met the description. And he was in security because, remember, he worked. the woman that worked said he worked for mm-hmm. me. She owned a security company. So that's sort of law enforcement-y. Mm-hmm. And he lived nearby the cornfield where Lori, Lori's body had been found. In fact, it was less than two miles away. Oh, wow. He had never been married. He had no children and he had no criminal history. So the first thing that they did was track down his most recent ex-girlfriend and interviewed her. 
Okay. She reported to the police. Well, they interviewed some of his friends. She, I should say that, like neighbors. They interviewed people like that. And all of them, really, co-workers and stuff, they were all kind of like, he seems fine. I mean, like, he's not an overly nice guy. He's not, you know, he's kind of just a normal Joe, like whatever. Mm-hmm. So they interview this ex-girlfriend, though, and she says, yeah, I thought that. I thought he was pretty endearing and normal at first, but... As I started dating him, he started to become really controlling and he had abusive personality traits and he had really strange sexual demands that I didn't like. And me saying that I didn't like them didn't really matter to him. Oh, so they're like, okay, deal. All right. Did he ever ask her to strip and pose? I don't know. I don't know that. It doesn't say that in any of the interviews it actually doesn't go into specifics on what his sexual demands were so i don't think she wanted to talk about it but okay also one other question as far as um not being able to ask what's her name to do the lineup because she's already been tainted with seeing the photo already um what about the witness that saw this person driving with a hat like could they go back to that person and see if they recognize oh um yeah they could have there's nothing in there that they actually did do that Mm -hmm. though okay also and i should mention this there's another real estate agent that um there just wasn't a good place to put this in here but there's another real estate agent that had been um like really close to around the time of Lori's um death Mm -hmm. that she was having an open house And then a guy had come into her open house and he was the only one there and he was acting really creepy and she got like the freak alert, you know, like something's Mm. going on. And so she ended up like making it in such a way that she wasn't in the house alone with him. Like she would like went to get something in her car anyway. And they did talk to this woman and she said that um, she said that the. Marcus White guy also kind of looked like the sketch of the lady Mm. that the Mm. other lady had said. Anyway, so all of these guys look kind of similar. And it was very clear that there was like a creepy guy walking around town. Mm -hmm. And this is what he looks like. And everyone across the board seems to think he looks pretty similar. But okay. Okay. So police then find Dale's brother. Mm. And they learn that the two of them are estranged. So they're not They don't have a relationship. They're not getting along. So like, okay, well, maybe this brother will tell us some stuff. Like Mm -hmm. he's got beef with him. So let's, let's talk to him. So they talk to the brother and he's like, I don't really know anything about what he's been involved in in the last couple years, but they play the voicemail message for him. Do you remember the real estate agent has a voicemail message from the person who attacked her and they play this for Dale's brother and Dale's brother is like, oh yeah. That's definitely Dale. Oh, wow. Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> Brother. Okay. So they bring Dale in for questioning and they search his home. Dale admits, I had sex with a real estate agent, but it was consensual. She was there for it. I was there for it. We took some pictures. We had a great time. There was no rape going on. I don't know why she's saying that. Blah, blah, blah. Mm. But the fact that he admitted to a sexual encounter with the real estate agent was enough for the police to get a warrant for his DNA. Yes. So they collect it. After they collect the DNA, you know, they're, they're like, all right, we're going to send that off for processing. Thanks so much. But they're continuing to talk to him and question him. Cause he and, probably doesn't realize that they found that DNA that matched that like woman's. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, so, I wouldn't have admitted. <laughs> they give the he gives the DNA. They send it out, and then they're like, "Show him a picture of Lori. Slide a little picture of Lori mm-hmm. across the table." And they're like, "You know anything about her?" And he's like, "No, Mm-mm. never seen her. I don't know anything about her. Claims to not ever seen her." And they're like, "Well, you know, we just took your DNA, and what will happen?" If we're able to tie your DNA to semen that was found on Lori's body. And as Hmm. soon as they say that, he drops his head and says, I'm effed. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So he doesn't admit to anything. He doesn't, you know, give a confession or anything about Lori and what happened to her. But that's kind of a little bit of an admittance. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So they were like, boom, got you. Right. And guess what? 
Dale's DNA was a match. It was a match for the real estate agent who had been assaulted and a match for Lori Hayes. So he was arrested and charged with the rape of the real estate agent and with the rape and murder of Lori. So, again, he doesn't admit what happened with Lori, so we can't exactly say what happened. But the police have kind of put some things together. They did say that he had, they think he clearly had an MO where he was going after these real estate agents. But because, you know, the one had gotten away and then because he had kind of been like, you know, somebody had caught on to like that he was trying to do like, you know, nefarious Mm -hmm. things with them that he had to kind of change his MO up a little bit and that he had taken Lori at random, which is just so scary. I hate that. It's like the most scariest thing ever. So they think that he chose her at random in the parking lot. That he forced her into the car at gunpoint, took her to an unknown location, raped her, killed her, put her in her car and drove it out to the cornfield and drug her body into the field and left it there. Then drove her car back to the shopping center where it originally was and abandoned it there. All with her 10-month-old baby in the back. That's what I was literally just sitting here thinking the entire time you were talking. I'm like, the kid's in the yeah. freaking back Don't seat. Don't <laughs> forget about Alexis. She is in the back. Oh, my gosh. Dale. Dale. Dale, Dale. Okay. So in 2001, Dale was convicted of the rape of the real estate agent. And then in November of 2002, he was found guilty of the rape and first-degree murder of Lori Hayes. And he was sentenced to to death. Whoa, wow. Okay. However, in 2003, the governor of Illinois abolished the death penalty and commuted all death sentences to life in prison. Mm. And a life in prison sentence is 60 years, right? Oh, okay. That's what they consider. Okay. So Dale has appealed his conviction several times. Once he was granted an appeal, but his conviction was unanimously upheld. And since then, his appeals have been denied. So he is currently serving out the 60-year life sentence in an Illinois prison, and he is 58 years old. He will be eligible for parole in 2062 at the age of 99 years old. Oh, my goodness. So, okay, good luck, Dale. Bye, boy. <laughs> Lori was buried back in Kentucky in her hometown where she grew up. And her daughter, Alexis, is now in her 20s, and it is reported that she is surrounded by family and love. Oh, gosh. Well, I'm glad that she's okay. Yes. Sorry about her mom, but glad she's okay. I'm glad that the the real estate agent who was raped got justice for her attack and that he is off the streets because he clearly would have kept going. Yes. If they hadn't gotten them. I agree. I thought this yeah. was going to be a longer case, too, and it's a little bit shorter. So there's a little tight, tight knee, like, wrapped up crown for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's good because last week was long. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and Springfield, Illinois is like an hour and a half for me. I know. I looked that up, too, actually. I'm surprised you didn't say something when I mentioned Springfield. Yeah. I mean, I was going to, then I was like, well, it's not really that relevant because it's not like it's around the corner or anything. But we literally, anytime we drive anywhere essentially in that direction we go right through springfield because i'm right. like oh it's so close and and it's the home of lincoln so there's so many things about lincoln there like so, abraham lincoln yeah really yeah there's like museums and i don't know maybe a log cabin i i don't know but there's just like so many things about lincoln there because uh, my husband's aunt said you should bring the kids there it's a good day trip like hour and a half go see all the lincoln things and come home we haven't done it yet, but we drive by it all well, <laughs> if you do go, um, I don't know if it's still there, but Lori was shopping at the Shoe Carnival in Springfield, Illinois. I'll look up the Shoe Carnival and take a picture I outside I for you. I don't think she bought any shoes, but I don't know. <laughs> oh, man. I know. Gosh. And poor Brad. Oh, my gosh. What a awful... Yeah, thing. I know. And especially, like, I'm sure people were looking at him funny, even though he was cleared, like still looking at him funny i know you know what i the saddest part i think for me too is like um thinking about this happening to Lori, 
and she's in the car with this man, this holding her at gunpoint and her baby is in the back and she had to be, that's like a whole nother level of terror. You know what I mean? When it's like you're in danger, but then you don't know what's going to happen to your child. Right. I know. And like, I hope that there has been some way that she has seen Alexis and knows that she's safe and has been able to get some kind of a peek. You know what I mean? Because it's like to think that she died terrified that something was going to happen to her baby is like, that's such a... And was she compliant a lot or like because she just wanted to make sure that Alexis was safe? Exactly. And, you know, I don't know if this was said, but like, did he even know the baby was in the back? Well, I'm at the time, I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know because we don't know really what happened. So I don't know if he just saw her get it out of the car and shoved right. her back in or like, yeah, exactly. And then was like, oh crap. Or but he didn't, didn't even hurt notice the baby. if the baby was sleeping, maybe didn't even notice that there was a baby back there initially. Yeah. Um, I don't and, know. Man. I mean, not, and I'm, I, I would like to think that he wouldn't have hurt the baby even if he knew, like, maybe he at right. least had some sort of decency that, I well, this baby's that he, not going to tell on me, so. If I'm being inside a mind of a killer, <laughs> which is yeah. gross, my guess would be he did not, and that that's why he returned to the car. Right. Because, you know, if he if he didn't know there was a baby and then got in the car and was like, oh, crap, there's a baby, I'm going to have to do something with this baby, I'll just take the car back. And roll the windows mm. down so people can buy the baby. Mm. You know? Yeah, maybe. He left all that That's evidence true. in the car, like, with the, the gun, the, the bullet, and blood. Right. I don't know. Hmm. Wow. We'll never well, know. We'll never know. But she's Alexis is safe, and he's in jail until he's 99. And thank God for that real estate agent, too. I know, right? She this probably wouldn't have solved been the case. Absolutely, hundred yeah. percent. She came forward. She told her story. She was active, super involved with wanting to go after her assailant. So mm-hmm. good on you. Yeah. It does matter. Well Thank done. you. Well Thank done. you for stepping up because I know what I know your name hard. is. But well yep. done. <laughs> Wonder Woman, Superwoman. Exactly. Woman. All right. Yeah, there you go. Happy Monday. Oh gosh, thanks for that. I mean, it's always glad to good to have like a solved. Not happy ending because there's always somebody that lost in the story. That yes. That's why we're telling it. But <sighs> it was a good story. Thank you. Thanks for telling it, Beth. You're welcome. Thank you, Laura, for the suggestion. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Knocked another one out of the park, La- yeah. Laura. <laughs> they always do these suggestions. Keep them coming. <laughs> So anyways, well, hope you guys enjoyed that episode. And if you did, go ahead and just go give us some five stars oh, please, a review because, you know, we get one like every couple weeks maybe or so. And we get so excited because we look all the time, but we get so excited when we see one and just would be great. So click that five star, type a little ditty out for us and um, make our day. So do that for us, if you will. And we hope you will join us again next week. And always remember, the world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closets.